This is Healthcare Now Radio's Interviews Now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carol Flagg, your host for today's episode. You can follow our show at hashtag interviews now and join the conversation. In this fast-paced, ever-changing landscape we call healthcare delivery, who can we trust to tell us the good, the bad, or what's happening now? We're here to help you sort out these issues with thought leaders in the know. On this episode, we talk with Belinda Minch, Vice President of Strategic Services of Advantum Health, about how the management of medical practices has evolved over the last decade and the impact on the industry with a pivot to value-based care. Hi, Belinda. Thanks so much for taking your time today. Thank you so much, Carol. Glad to be okay. here. Oh, glad to have you. So before we start on today's conversation, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your role at Advantum Health? Sure. As you said, um, my name is Belinda Minch. I'm Vice President of Strategic Services with Advantum Health. I've been in this role just coming up on a year now, and within that role, I help ensure client success across our over 150 um, billing and practice management clients across the country, um, in addition to helping lead our consulting services. Uh, before joining Advantum Health, I was with um, Intermedics, a similar type company um, in the space of revenue cycle as well as practice management, and helped manage a 60-provider pediatric group in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, prior experience of that includes working uh, for both hospitals um, on a consulting front as well as a management front, and really entered into healthcare um, like a lot of folks do by just working in a, a practice office environment and really developing an interest from there and having it grow over time. And how long have you been in healthcare? Um, just over 15 years now. Yeah. So having managed practices and been and, and started in on the clinical side like this from an RCM standpoint and a and practical management standpoint, uh, it, you're obviously have seen a lot of changes. I mean, we're going to be talking about this uh, in our conversation today, but obviously you've been front and center and on the front lines of of what's sort of happened in healthcare the past 10 to 15 years. Absolutely. So, you know, over the last decade, having started kind of in a very small practice environment and then moving to the larger scale of working with hospitals, you know, certainly saw the federal regulations hitting the hospitals and how they changed. Um, but then more recently going back into the practice management side and, you know, if we think about hospitals and the change that they have to undergo, all of that is amplified when you think about physician practices because their resources um, are really truncated uh, just by their, uh, you know, smaller margins, obviously, and, and smaller room um, for error. So, but over the last decade, you know, practice management itself has become increasingly co complex. Um, the job of the front desk, if you think about it, used to just be collecting some basic, you know, provi uh, patient demographic information at the check-in process and then really handing off the chart to the medical assistant. And today we're asking our staff members to really understand their role in the billing process. Um, you know, we have to have them check eligibility. We're asking them to do pre-authorizations. We're asking them to do referrals. We're having them collect um, co-pays and deductibles. We're having them ask for patient balances. Uh, you know, and that leads to a, re a review of accounts. So um, even when you partner with the billing company or you do it in-house, you're working, you know, all of your staff has to be knowledgeable in that space. And that administrative burden, um, it really has grown in the last decade, and, and I'm only talking about the front desk area. So if we think about, you know, how that happens on the backside too in terms of the clinical front, um, the workflows have certainly changed. The um, requirements for capturing data have changed to meet the quality measures uh, that are required for reporting. Um, those have uh, certainly altered how practices are able to see the number of patients that they need to see, and that's important because our population is only continuing to age in, in larger numbers. Yeah, and, and, and certainly as you talk about all of that, I mean, obviously from a billing standpoint and health insurance and value-based care, all of those have had an impact, I'm sure, on the entire workflow of a practice, albeit a small one, mid-size, large, and even at the hospital level. And talk a little bit, if you can, too, this, the adoption of EHR technology. Certainly that's a layer on top of this as well. Absolutely, and we still work with a number of practices that have not moved to electronic medical records because they couldn't 
find um, just the justification in spending the amounts of money um, in terms of investing into an electronic medical record. So we still have a number of providers out there. You know, I'm, I'm limited to the, you know, the, the Louisville market, at least the, the folks that I work with most closely, though we work with clients across the country. Um, where they're still on paper charts uh, because they did not make that investment um, several years ago when um, electronic medical workers were certainly being uh, uh, encouraged. So today, as we think about this, uh, you know, we think about the number of charts and, again, the number of processes involved and how that information is captured. I think we're hitting the tipping point of being able to stay on paper for a number of practices, especially those that want to scale and grow in their yeah. presence. You know, the expense has certainly um, declined since then. The investment is certainly lower. You know, it used to require a huge investment in servers, and, you know, the licenses were really outrageous. Well, everything's cloud-based now, and there are other options to having, uh, you know, buy a server, put it in-house, and pay that um, technology support fee and, and those types of um, additional costs that go along with an electronic medical record. Um, the argument still is that electronic medical records will not capture the same level of data as could be captured um, by a provider doing their full-on own dictation and notation. Um, but the counterpoint to that is also the, uh, the ability to extract that information and report it back to the government agencies to ensure you know, compliance with quality payment programs and not take Medicare hits and reimbursement. So the challenges of the average, let's just say the average medical practice for, again, they come in various sizes and obviously specialties and, and family and all that. So um, the, ch the challenges are varied, but I think what I'm hearing is that there are additional challenges across the board for most medical practices these days because of, like you said, you know, technology issues, certainly cloud security issues in, in the age of cybersecurity, mm -hmm. um, reporting, meaningful use, of course, uh, in, before this year and now transitioning into the MIPS program under, under the quality payment and MACRA. So the, 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 a lot of challenges, right? Uh, and I, I imagine these practices, if they're not adding staff, they're certainly asking their staffs to do more than they used to. And so do you think these challenges, are, are, these, are, they, are, are, they, are these challenges driving, and these myriad of, of issues, are they, are they driving clinicians away from the independent practice landscape in favor of hooking onto a hospital? You know, I think so. Yeah, I think your more recent um, medical school graduates today are looking uh, for more stability. You know, there there is a generation gap in terms of those physicians that hung a shingle maybe 30 years ago versus those getting out of school today, experiencing the debt that they have and needing an environment where their paycheck is guaranteed and perhaps some of their medical school loans are forgiven given their service to a particular healthcare organization. So the industry has certainly experienced a shift from this independent physician model to the hospital or health system owned physician groups. Um, it probably peaked out maybe, you know, within the last 10 years and we're probably at a leveling out period now and health systems are now trying to figure out um, how to manage their employed groups. And thinking more strategically about how they fit in the marketplace, they're making adjustments so they're not even keeping everybody that they may have employed. And when that happens, there is an opportunity to then um, think about whether or not these physicians spinning off of health system environments are prepared to now make a, um, a move towards an independent practice environment. Um, but there's still a market for providers to set up independent practices. Um, we're seeing smaller numbers of those providers willing to take the risk. Uh, but what we are seeing is maybe different management models to help support um, these independent groups. We're seeing a lot of super groups um, grow mm -hmm. out of just smaller physician groups that are coming together under one tax ID. You know, in addition to leveraging savings, you know, they're trying to effectively man manage the quality factor. And they're increasing their covered lives, of course, with payers and trying to negotiate contracts based on their ability to effectively address the health needs of those covered lives. So you touched upon it just like for a, a, s a second here in your in your in your last statement, and, and that is sort of the the the, the value based care. So talk a little bit about 
what the modern medical practice needs to do to achieve value-based care as the industry moves down this path, you know. I mean, value-based care, you know, obviously the industry's been talking about it the last couple of years. Certainly when MACRA mm-hmm. passed, um, that was obviously the, you know, uh, you know, they when they, you know, repealed the sustainable growth rate model and uh, passed MACRA, obviously that was a sea change for providers across the country. So, so, mm-hmm. so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, value-based care uh, layered on top of moving, so we're moving away from fee-for-service to value-based care. In a, in sure. a nutshell, what is the impact on an independent practice in doing that? Sure. And so, as you know, you just covered um, during, you know, even when I was doing my master's in health administration, we always talked about the quality chasm and, you know, how are we connecting payment with quality? And it's been creeping along because every year um, I used to facilitate board meetings um, for um, hospital boards. And we talk about is the healthcare quality imperative really here? Uh, So on the hospital side, it obviously started with, you know, readmission rates and then Um, dinging payments when there was a readmit. Obviously, that's still ongoing. And then on the physician practice side, you know, PQRS and, you know, whether or not the appropriate measures were reported and whether or not a practice was going to take a hit. Obviously, the growth to MIPS and MACRA. So in terms of, you know, how we're helping practices address that today, um, you know, you'd be surprised or maybe you wouldn't in terms of when you walk into a practice and asking for some basic information to really grab a snapshot of where they are today. So, Almost step one is their current state, and we help them evaluate their current state and then start to think about, you know, where they want to be in the next three to five years. Do they think they're growing? You know, what is their market doing? Um, You know, what are some of those factors that are going to play into how they effectively address their population? And so when we do our practice assessment, you know, we want really a good understanding of the operations um, and obviously their surrounding market. We look at a lot of data, including their patient origin, their payer mix, you know, even disease rates, look at the productivity by provider, we look at fee schedules, um, and financial metrics as well, but then we spend our time observing. So we observe workflow, we observe processes, and then we really map those out so that individuals can visualize how efficient or inefficient a process may be. Um, And, you know, when all of that is put together, when the analysis is complete, we can work with the practice to understand the critical points of intervention, basically the things that must change to improve workflow, to improve that patient information capture, and that ties all the way back into the ability to report on those quality metrics. I'm going to just take a station break here for a second. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to interviews now. And our guest today is Belinda Minch, the Vice President of Strategic Services of Advantum Health. So, Belinda, let me let me ask you this. Just from a 30,000 feet up level, and you, you, you manage practices. You've been in, involved in practices in hospitals for 15 years, dealing with workflows, their communications, uh, their th- these federal initiatives. Uh, what is the state of mind, if you don't mind my asking, of, of like mm-hmm. the average physician out there, the average the average provider, it, you know, with the High Tech Act and now MACRA mm-hmm. and the reporting process is changing and and this, this change of how their Medicare reimbursements will be will be affected. What is the state of mind out there? I'm just I'm curious. <laughs> you know, I think in general um, they're exhausted. I think, you know, there's so much research and discussion these days of provider burnout, and I think it's really evident when we talk to our providers. And it's a sad place to be because these are the individuals that have obviously invested so much time and money and energy into earning their um, their patient care degrees, whether it's a physician, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, you know, any of these caretakers. Um, but they, they're simply, they're exhausted. You know, they have, uh, in addition to trying to manage a patient load every day, they're trying to run a business for those that are independent. They're running a business. They're trying to understand um, the new insurance rules. And, you know, why did a certain insurance payer change payer IDs and nothing's getting paid anymore? So all of a sudden they're having to become not just business experts, but almost billing experts and um, quality program experts. And they're needing to expand uh, and invest more time where they just simply don't have any. So I think the general state of mind is probably exhaustion. And what's, in your opinion, 
perhaps the sh I mean, I'm not sure. I, guess, I don't know if anybody can look in a crystal ball and find out what the long-term impact of that is, especially the physician, mm -hmm. physician burnout. There's a lot of studies that have, that have gone on the last couple of years about that particular issue um, related to phys physician burnout. Short-term, though, you know, obviously healthcare right now uh, is in the middle of some sort of evolution, right? Um, mm -hmm. And like so many things, it's it's hard to to see to see what's around the next curve or the bend in the road. I mean, we know we're all going someplace and we're driving down this road, mm -hmm. but it's hard to see where we're getting to, right? But what what, what do you what in your opinion is is the impact of this going to have? Let's just say in the next year or two. Yeah, I think we've been talking about it for a number of years in terms of, um, you know, physician shortages. So uh, mm -hmm. I know when I did, um, you know, physician manpower planning for even small rural hospitals, we talked about the need to recruit and, you know, what were some of those most effective recruitment models because so many communities were going to to be short on physicians. And now those are the most at-risk communities out in the rural areas with less access to care. Um, that cannot, you know, come into a larger community because of transportation and other reasons. But I think we're going to see more of that. You know, those that are on the brink of retirement are probably going to accelerate their retirement plans uh, just to not have to deal with the next round of whatever the federal government puts out there uh, for the next quality program or the next hoop to jump through just to get paid by Medicare. Uh, so I think it will accelerate some retirements in some areas. Uh, but on the other side of that, you know, not, not specific to the physician, but really specific to the industry, is certainly growth in the technology and the services that will be available to help navigate that as well. So when you say that, are you sort of speaking, uh, you know, about the, the, the virtual care side of this, telemedicine, telehealth, that, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. So there's, um, you know, obviously telehealth is growing significantly, um, again, out, of, out in the rural communities to better serve those patients on uh, those more complex cases where uh, patients can't travel. Um, so that's one method of, of where technology is inserting itself, but we're getting smarter about, you know, how we utilize our data as well. I think the holy grail out there is, you know, predictive analytics is, you know, sure. how do we take all of this information and be able to predict the patient's next um, encounter of care. How do we prepare for that and then how do we intervene before it even gets to the, the office level? And so again, utilizing this information and trying to make, um, make sense of it so that it's effective in its use will be certainly key to kind of how this, the technology around healthcare management evolves. Well, certainly um, predictive analytics, um uh, you know, AI, pop health, you know, these are, these are precision medicine, you know, the, you know, the, the, exactly. the, 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 that term obviously, or that concept is, is really trending in the industry right now. All of that is geared mm -hmm. towards, uh, you know, patient care, not being um, reactive, but being more proactive. Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, <clears throat> Let's let's switch gears just a, a, a second here, or for a few minutes, and talk about your specialization, which is RCM, right? Rev Revenue cycle performance. So, uh, what sort of metrics and and processes should these practices be focusing on right now to help drive revenue cycle management and improving? That right, because obviously that's a worry out there, a worry for providers yeah. how they're going to get paid. Not only how they're going to get paid, but how quickly they're going to get paid, right? Um, exactly. So, what are things that what are things that you that you talk to uh, to your clients about? Sure. Um, you know, the the revenue cycle is very process driven, and so there are key things that need to happen, obviously, at each stage to ensure that the cash flow continues to come in the door and is strong and is um, exactly what we think it's going to be. Um, and with that said, you know, we lean on a number of metrics that assist us in checking the health of the revenue cycle at certain points. Um, even with that said, the revenue cycle itself requires what I think is one of the main keys is checks and balances. So we have a number of processes in terms of, you know, eligibility taking place on the front end, but, you know, what does that mean on the back end and are we feeding back information to the front desk when something doesn't happen on the, um, at the check-in process? Uh, but, you know, to, back to answer your question, you know, in addition to kind of the most familiar metrics of, you know, days in AR, a gross collection rate, 
and net collection rate. You know, we also focus on the first pass claims acceptance rate, and that's the percentage of paid transactions just versus the total number of submitted transactions just based on the first submission. So um, in our case, you know, when we want to think about, you know, how not just clean claims, but, you know, how many are actually getting paid the very first time we send them out, it gives us a good indication of where some of the issues may be um, because that's our goal. We don't want to touch a claim more than once. We want to get it out the door. We want to get it paid, posted, and we want to move on to our next thing. Um, we also look at the denial rate. Um, you know, again, it's information that is so valuable but hard to capture. And the denial rate is simply the percentage of the total claims denied um, as a percentage of those um, submitted. But every single claim that comes back in-house has a denial code tied to it. Uh, but depending on the practice management system and the staff on hand, uh, it is a um, it is hit or miss whether or not those the denial rate reasons are effectively captured. And when that's not effectively captured, then it's um, harder to put a plan in place to start to address the, uh, the, the kind of core issues or the root cause issues of claims not being paid. Um, we also take a deeper dive, you know, in addition to just looking at AR days, we want to look at AR that's greater than 120 days, and we want to break that down to understand if there are outstanding credentialing or provider enrollment issues. Um, that can happen. We've experienced it a lot um, with uh, Medicaid and Medicaid uh, managed care programs in terms of just provider enrollment taking um, an extended period of time to complete, and so the holding claims process and ensuring that we get those out the door as soon as providers are appropriately credentialed and loaded with payers. Um, and then we also break this down into patient balance. So, uh, you know, patient balance is probably the hardest, the hardest bucket to collect yeah. at times. Yeah, and we need to look at whether or not additional action is needed by the practice or the, a collection agency. And, you know, a, a metric like this is a good example where, you know, we might want to talk to practices about revising, you know, or reviewing at least their, finan their patient financial policy. We want to look at options for um, patient collections through whether or not that means having um, card on file technology where automatic payments can be charged or even, you know, being more aggressive about the collections process. And none of those are pretty, but um, they yeah. really do drive the success of being able to lower that accounts receivable for practices. I, I just have this visual that, that, that you go in and, and start working with a, with a new client or a practice and you must just see these like little black holes everywhere. Like the, the, the information goes in and, and there's not enough light, you can't even see it, you know what I mean? It just disappears yeah. down this little black hole. Absolutely. And, and that happens more often than not and, and sometimes it's, you know, again, it's doing the things, you know, doing things the way we've always done them and sometimes we're not even sure why we do them anymore but we continue to do it that way and technology has a better solution but we haven't taken advantage of it yet. Yeah, yeah. And of course it's the people factor too. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got a few minutes left in our conversation today and and, and so perhaps you could talk uh, just a little bit touch upon resources. What what can practices do to be successful in managing all of this? What resources do you give them or do they, should they be turning to? Yeah, so, you know, we're in this age of, you know, technology and information, right? We all are yeah. functioning on our phones and we're on the internet nonstop. And so there's this incredible focus on data and analytics. And having that information um, is one thing, but obviously being able to translate it to leverage that information to improve reimbursement, improve workflow, and and operations, you know, help manage costs and capture the right data elements, you know, that's where, again, the rubber hits, um, meets the road. So, again, there's so much information that, you know, one of the keys, I guess one of the skill sets that uh, practice managers really need to have today is how to distill the information that we get and down to key elements and then how to translate it back to different audiences within a practice. So how do we translate it and communicate it to the physician owners and how it's going to impact them versus how we communicate it to staff members and how it will impact, you know, what they do um, at the front desk or in the, in the clinical setting. But by sharing that information, it allows, you know, not just the physicians and the physician owners um, and staff members to be engaged, but it 
really gives them more context of how their task or their job kind of impacts the bigger picture. Um, so, you know, along with leadership that fosters and kind of guides change and, and engages staff, you know, we talked about it just briefly, but we need to continue to leverage technology that allows us to work smarter, not harder. Um, so I grew up in offices where I had to call on patient eligibility of every patient, and now we have automated eligibility through almost, you know, all of the practice management platforms out there. And, you know, instead of mailing back statements with credit card information written on a remit slip, you know, we're offering patients the ability to pay their bill online. And technology, you know, continues to evolve, obviously, and it's changing how we work. Um, in the RCM field, Advantum Health um, is working a lot on RPA, robotic process automation. Uh, you know, we're using robots to mimic data entry and to write scripts to effectively help our team, you know, prioritize work cues and focus where our greatest opportunities exist. And so really all those factors in terms of leveraging technology, leveraging the information, um, really translating it back to staff members and communicating it effectively will engage staff in, you know, the, the practice of success in the long term. Great. Belinda, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. You can learn more about Belinda and Advantum Health at www.advantumhealth.com. Dot com. As always, we thank you listeners for tuning in today. For more information about interviews now, visit our show's program page on www.healthcarenowradio.com. And until next time, if it's happening in healthcare and it's now, it's on interviews now. Mm -hmm.